The Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast, number 153. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast. You were like the uh, carrot top of interviewers. Wow, how disappointing was that question? You did not just ask me that. That's a very big question. Never mind, I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing the show. Wow, I can't believe it. I, I'm telling you, I'm I'm hooked. Nick, 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 Nick. Yeah, he's so awesome. He's um, still a good friend of mine. Welcome to the Fan Counters Celebrity Podcast. My name's Nick. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I will not leave you disappointed. I've got a great guest for you, and I will tell you all about him in just a minute. First of all, you can follow us on social media if you haven't found our Instagram, and guessing by the numbers you haven't, it's at Fan Counters Live on Instagram. Go ahead and subscribe there. If you want to join our big Facebook group, there's over 25,000 people hanging out at Fan Counters on Facebook, and our small group is called Sharpie Nation. So if you want to join the private group, go ahead and search Sharpie Nation like the Sharpie marker on Facebook. Uh, I am also available via email. If you have a celebrity guest that you want to hear on the show, send their name along, and if I get them, I will get you on the show with them. It's like a celebrity meet and greet here on Fan Counters. Just email me at hello at fancounters.com. Now, stay tuned after the show because we're going to catch up with my favorite podcast, Smartless, and we'll find out what they've been up to, those little chuckleheads. We're going to talk about them. Uh, at the end of the episode today. But first, we've got Billy Van Zant on the program today. And Billy Van Zant is an actor and writer. He has a brand new book out called Get in the Car, Jane Adventures in the TV Wasteland. We're going to go and talk about all of those stories, or many of them, that are featured in the book, including his encounters with Lucille Ball, writing for the show Martin. And we're also going to chat a little bit about Bob Newhart. So we have got a lot of topics to cover on the show today, as well as Jaws 2. We're going to talk some Star Trek. This is a good interview. Billy's a very captivating person. He's got a lot of great stories about his time in Hollywood. Billy Van Zant is on the program. And this episode of Fan Counter starts right now. Billy Van Zant, welcome to the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm thrilled to talk to you, not only because you have a fantastic new book out that I talked a little bit about in the opening, but also you have identical twin sons. And I bring this up because I have identical twin daughters. I know your sons are in their early stages of their life, you know, in their 20s. I'm still living those elementary days with mine. So I guess my first question oh. is, dad to dad, oh, what you're, advice? You're going to have a lot of fun. I used to think that it was, you know, a lot. it was, it was a lot of work. But I, I, I felt sorry for myself until I was in a restaurant with just me and the two kids. And I looked over at a table and I saw a father with triplets. Ooh. And I thought, well, I got off easy. <laughs> no, I loved, I, boy, I loved having, I, well, I, I loved my kids, but yeah. I, I loved having twins. It was great. Do you have any advice that you wish you were given when your kids were young like mine are that you never got? Um, hmm. Oh, that's a good question. I would say, uh... Yeah, just relish every moment of it, even the even the the sleepless nights and everything else, because it goes by so fast, mm. so yeah. fast. I turned around, my kids were in college, and it just flipped me out. Um, but uh, I changed my whole my whole uh, my whole work schedule once the kids were born, because I never wanted to leave the house. <laughs> right. So I went. Yeah. I, I did. It's true. I went from creating TV shows to going. Yeah, I'll just consult on somebody else's show so I can go home at five o'clock. And, uh, boy, I just, uh, I don't remember my life before the kids were born. I mean, I do, but, yeah, I know uh, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, greatest thing that I ever did. You wrote a lot of stuff down about your life, which enabled you to write a book called get in the car, Jane, a reference to your yeah. writing partner, which is awesome. That just came out. And you said you wrote the book for your sons because besides creating television shows, they didn't really get what you did. So did you intentionally the whole time keep these notes and journals throughout your career, knowing that someday oh, I might write a book? No, <laughs> no, I kept journals and I never kept journals before working in TV. And I haven't kept journals on anything else in my life, just on the TV shows, because the, the work schedule is so intense that I didn't want to forget anything. Hmm. 
so at the you know at the end of it wasn't every day but you know every every couple of days or at least at least once a week while we were working on the tv shows i would scribble down something that happened a funny story and all this sort of thing just so i have it and then if i wrote or talked to anybody back home you know i I could reference it and go oh yeah that happened and so when i started writing this book uh it really started out as uh, really there was just going to be like one chapter explaining how a TV show works, more of an essay. And then I started going, well, wait a minute, I got these journals and I went through each show. So every chapter is a different show we worked on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I hope by the time you finish the whole book, not only are you just getting a lot of gossipy, funny stories, but you, in, in little increments, you learn what it is I did for a living in terms of writing a TV show, creating a show, running a show. Well, the drama about writing those shows was actually some of the best captivating parts of the book. And I want to ask you about a few of those pieces in, in a few minutes. But first, I want okay. to go back uh, to the, your first on-screen acting experience. I've heard you talk on other interviews a lot about Jaws 2. And then one question that never gets answered is, did they make you swim for an audition? Like, is that part of the process for Jaws? No, this is funny. They, they asked everybody if they could swim. But nobody, they didn't test us until we got to, I think it was Martha's Vineyard. It might have been Florida. But um, they made us all tread water. If you couldn't tread water for 10 minutes, you were getting back on a plane. And so they put us all out in the water. And everybody started treading water. And me and maybe three other people realized, I can touch the bottom here. (laughs) So... Okay. I just, I just stood, I just stood on the bottom of the water and moved my arms like I was treading water, because I and I could have treaded water, but I, I, uh, <laughs> I thought, well, I'm not going to work that hard if I don't have to. Yeah. So I just moved my arms and, they, and I passed the test and I stayed in the film. Now, Jaws Two was, from what I hear, an interesting experience for your first film because there were no stunt people. And when I went back and watched Jaws Two in preparation for this interview. They literally would like slam boats together, and I didn't remember kind of how violent everything was. To know that yeah. you know the actors probably really could have gotten killed. Were you surprised at how much they pushed the actors without stunt people? Well, we were all naive. We were all young. It was for the for the most part, it was everybody's first movie, so we were just anxious to be there. And I, I have a little Buster Keaton in me anyway, so I was all ready to, you know, give me you got a stunt for me to do. Happy to do it. But I remember the very first time we met Murray Hamilton, who played the mayor. He, he cornered Keith Gordon and uh, Tom Dunlop and I in the lobby of the hotel. And this was my the, my first words of advice I got for making a film came from him. And he just came up to us, and I think he was it had maybe oh nine or ten drinks by then, I think. And he said, "They'll kill you as long as they get the shot. Remember that they'll kill you." And that was my introduction to working in film. Uh, but uh, we did, yeah, we were, you know, if, if the boat had to slam into the other boat, we got on the boat and slammed into the other boat. Uh, when we had to, when we shot the scene where the helicopter gets eaten by the shark and flips upside down and the blades of the, of the helicopter fly off, they had us sit on the trampoline of the boat and they threw blades at us. Oh, my gosh. So, you know. Uh, the only actual dangerous stunt uh, uh, was when, uh, during my death scene, which got cut out of the film, uh, they had a stunt man do it, and I looked at it in the dailies, and I said, "That doesn't look like me. I want to do. I want to do that." And producer David Brown said, "You can't. You can't do that." I said, "I want to do that. It doesn't look like me. I want to be. I, that's. I should be me." Yeah. And he said, "Okay, it's got to be the last thing we shoot." I said, "Why does it have to be the last thing we shoot?" He said, in case you die. <laughs> so so what we did, we shot it. They put ropes around my waist. They put me on, the, on the, the broken boat, the pontoon of the boat. They had scuba divers underwater ready to yank on the ropes and pull me under. And, and then the, the shark on its mechanical roller coaster thing came up, crashed down on top of me, and they pulled me under, and the shark and I disappeared underwater at the same time. And it wasn't until, oh, a year or so later, I looked back on that and went, what did you do, you imbecile? <laughs> you know, I could have been killed. But uh, it was a great death scene, and they never used it in the film because it would have given the movie an R-rated film. So you did all that for nothing. And I've yeah. heard that you yeah. still haven't found that footage, have you? No, 
No, I know it's got to exist somewhere. Yeah. So if anybody out there listening can find it, uh, <laughs> I would appreciate it. The, yeah, there's, there's two, two scenes of mine got cut. Uh, my introduction scene, which hurts a little bit, and then the, uh, and the death scene. And what they ended up doing is they, uh, they, they knew all along it was touch and go whether it was going to be a PG movie or an R-rated movie. And uh, they didn't want it to be an R-rated movie because they'd lose money at the box office. So it got to my death, and they went, oh, we're not sure about this. So they had me do an inserted scene where I swim up on the rocks and, you know, I, I thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm hugging the rocks. Uh, but if, if you look at the last scene of the movie, the camera pulls back and you see all the kids on the island. I'm not there because I, <laughs> I was dead. <laughs> I want to hear a little bit about uh, the last question for Jaws 2 is about the shark, because I know that obviously you just mentioned you shot scenes where it ate and bit your legs off. Tell me about this humongous contraption that was part of you know the star of the film what was it like working with this huge shark and it was not the same one as the first one right no they rebuilt it roy arbogast uh, put that together uh they had a couple of different ones they had just the 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 top of the shark that you know if you do a, a shot from above you just see the, the top of the shark being pulled almost like a surfboard through the water um and then they had i think they had three or four altogether. And one was just the fin. Uh, but the, the main big thing that, that actually was housed right outside my hotel room where we stayed. So, uh, it's a massive thing and they bring it out to the water. And for all the, all the talk about how it, you know, didn't work, it didn't work. It worked pretty good. Hmm. You know, I, I think there were maybe three days or so or something was wrong. Uh, but other than that, uh, the reason the film took so long, was because you're dealing with how many boats were there? Ten boats out, <laughs> out yeah, in the yep. out in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and you, you get things like, okay, swim towards the reflection of the on the on the water. And it's like we can't. It's different from our angle than it is from your angle. We can't see what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so those things, those things were rough. Uh, but uh, we also did. There were about uh, there was a month of rehearsal. Uh, with the, the first director whom they let go and, and then they replaced him and the writer and most of the cast. Uh, so we did a month Then I got sent home and then I got a call saying, all right, you're meeting in Florida in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So I flew to Florida and suddenly there was a whole new cast, no new director, new writer. It was very, very, uh, very mind blowing. Cause I didn't know that was a possibility. Wow. Um, wow. yeah. And, uh, I still don't know why. They never, they never had me re-audition. They, uh, they, they made all the other actors, I think, except Dan Dusenberry and somebody else. Everybody else had to fly to California and re-audition for the new director. I didn't have to do that. I don't, I still don't know why. So we, in the first month we got to Florida, we also didn't shoot. We, we learned how to sail, and we, our job consisted of sailing and getting tan. That was, that was our, <laughs> that was our job for four weeks, and then we shot the film, and we ended up doing. Uh, uh, maybe a month in uh, a month in California just to do pickup shots at the end. And Carl Gottlieb was writing this script d like the day before you're going to shoot something, right? Carl Gottlieb. It was weird because I didn't appreciate this at the time, but now that I've been writing for a hundred years, I I am, am in total awe that he got away with doing this. Carl was locked in a hotel room writing scenes from scratch for whatever we were going to shoot the next day while we were shooting the film. So it was, you know, he didn't have any prep time at all. Wow. Uh, the director didn't really have any prep time at all. Um, and, and I, I, I always say this, I felt, I feel so bad in retrospect because Carl, uh, Carl would, you know, be trapped in his, uh, his room all day writing. And the second he would come out to try and get something to eat, every single person he passed, and I mean, the whole hotel was just our crew. Every single person he passed, how's it going, Carl? How's it going, Carl? How's it going, Carl? He wanted, must have wanted to blow his brains out. Yeah. But uh, he did an awesome job. I mean, the audiences don't care what, you know, they don't care what you have to do to finish, to, to make the film. They only want to see the film. But if you, if, you, if you knew what he and the director had to go through to pull that off, they did a phenomenal job. And I couldn't tell when I rewatched the film. I knew that piece of information in my head, and it, 
you you can't tell. I mean, that's professionals and a big budget film. And, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, following Jaws two, you were in a movie that my wife loves, the very first Star Trek movie, and I just want to <laughs> touch on something that we both kind of always have questions about, and that's the makeup, which is quite elaborate, especially for your character. We just wanted to know what time do you have to arrive on set, and how much earlier is that than everybody else to get into this makeup? I was, I was there uh, an hour and a half ahead of everybody else. Uh, they made a mold of my head, which I still have on a shelf somewhere, um, and they they built this sort of bumped forehead, mm-hmm. and then there's a wig that went around that, and. Uh, they had contact lenses that were painted yellow with red X's in them. I couldn't see two feet with those things in my eyes. They weren't made like today's contact lenses. They were basically like painted with house paint, I think. Oh my gosh. And, uh, uh, and the, um, Leonard Nimoy and I were the only two who came early. Everybody else, you know, show up right, you know, normal time. Uh, and funny thing for me was that he would, he would, he, he didn't talk to me at all. He would sit there with the script and scribble and scribble and scribble. And then William Shatner would come in much later and Leonard would say, okay, in this scene, I'm going to do this and you're going to do this. And then I'm going to say this and you're going to do this. And then, and William Shatner would just say, sure, whatever you want, whatever you want. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but I loved working on it. I really did. I was sort of, uh, I had my hopes up for about three seconds when Robert Wise uh, interviewed me. Uh, he told me that Leonard Nimoy probably wasn't going to come to work and I would have a different, you know, my alien on the ship would suddenly take on a l- little more meaning, you know. And uh, so I had I, I had a second and a half of thinking, I'm the new Spock, you know. <laughs> and, uh, of course, he, he showed up the next day and everything was fine. So, um but but there was a, there was a, a split second where I thought this oh this could be big, uh, but I did love working on it. I loved watching Robert Wise work as a director. He shot everything. You know, he's a very famous editor. He shot the film as an editor. You could see uh, when he would shoot a scene, he would you know do the master for you know just a portion. He would do close ups for just a portion, and and you realize after the fact you can't re edit his film. He shot exactly the way he wanted it to go, wow. which was fascinating. No, yeah. no extra footage. And, uh, no extra footage. Well, there were the, the scenes got cut. You know, uh, a lot of my a lot of my stuff got cut out, um, well, along with everybody else, not just me. Yeah. But um, but it was, it was a long movie, and there was so much secrecy around that film because it was the very first Star Trek mm-hmm. film. Um, so. The, the 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 secrecy on the set was um, was incredible. The, the Paramount Pictures had you know some special security guards to make sure nobody got in to see anything and all this stuff. And um, I was not allowed out for lunch, which I think was illegal. But <laughs> they told me I couldn't go anywhere because they didn't want anybody to see my makeup. So um, and at the time I was still just trying to audition for other things as an actor. I remember <laughs> wrapped wrapped my head with this massive turban <laughs> and I went and auditioned for uh, Bobby Hoffman over at the Gary Mar- all the Gary Marshall shows and uh, they knew they knew I'd been in, you know I was in Star Trek so they, they sort of went with it yeah and I remember uh, <laughs> I can't remember his name um, Phil Foster who played the father on Laverne and Shirley he just happened to be walking by and he saw me with this strange makeup and a big turban on my head and you said, wow, if you're going to this much trouble, I sure hope you get the part, kid. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was fun. I did four months on that. And um, and I really liked everybody in the cast. It was really just uh, it was a really, it was a fun, fun shoot. Let's talk a little bit about your book. I'm going to jump right into chapter one. And you're going to think, well, gosh, this guy's lazy. He's starting with chapter one. He didn't want to read it. But believe me, uh, I read quite a few chapters later on that are very uh, that interested me a lot. And it generated some questions. But Lucille Ball is in your first chapter. And it's really a funny story because you tell about how as soon as you landed in L.A., the first thing you did was go to Lucille Ball's house. Now, the first time I went to L.A., 
I drove to the Brady Bunch house right away. That was the one thing I really oh, wanted to see. Yeah. Now, I did <laughs> not go up and ring the doorbell there. thinking the Bradys were going to answer, but you did ring Lucille Ball's doorbell. What did you think was going to happen? I thought she was going to come out. I was going to introduce myself, tell her how much she had meant to me and influenced me, and she was going to uh, then work with me somewhere. That's what the, <laughs> that was pretty much my intention. I was very ballsy back then, so... Well, I guess I am now too, but back, back then, you know, th- there was no other reason for me to, to be in California except to meet her. Okay. And, uh, so I went to her house, knocked on the door and of course I had the, had the door slammed in my face by the butler and, uh, and, uh, but 10 years later, I got to meet her. I got to work with her. I got to know her a little bit and, uh, I got invited to the same house and, uh, it was just fantastic. And she, you know, you're afraid of meeting all your idols because uh, they're you're afraid they're going to turn out to be jerks or something. She was fantastic. She was everything I wanted her to be. Um, she taught me. Everybody's like, "Why Lucille Ball?" Because she taught me timing. Mm-hmm. She taught me. She taught me comedy timing. Um, if you look at those shows, a lot of her laughs. I'd say most of her laughs are not scripted. They're they're things that she would in- intuitively do or how to milk the audience a little bit and, and make one laugh turn into three laughs. Um, she was brilliant. So yeah. I studied her as a kid and I studied the scripts. I studied the, uh, the writing of that show and that taught me how to structure a script. Huh. So when I went, started writing sitcoms, I knew that I knew the sort of formula, yeah. you know, it's really funny that you did that to her as far as uh, going right to her house and her doorman rang the bell. You also tell a story where Lucy told you, when she tried oh, yeah, to meet yeah, Charlie yeah. Chaplin, the same thing happened to her where she knocks on his door and somebody else answers where, you know, they didn't meet at that time either, which is kind of a, a funny little tidbit. It was weird because the, uh, you know, I, when I went, went up to the door, I mean, it was it was verbatim my story when she told it. Because um, I, I pulled up in front of her house. Jane hid under, the, my girlfriend at the time, hid under the dashboard. She said, what are you doing? I said, I got to meet her. So I get out of the car and I walked up, knocked on the door and the house boy said, you know, I said, Billy Van Zandt's here to see Lucille Ball. <laughs> She's not home. Slammed the door in my face. I got back in the car and left. So that was 10 years uh, earlier. And so 10 years later, I'm sitting in her house with her. And I said, did you ever meet Charlie Chaplin? And she said, no, but I'll tell you a story. I found out where he lived in 1976. So my husband, Gary, and I drove to the house. But Gary wouldn't get out of the car. He hid under the dashboard and I got out. And I walked up and I knocked on the door and I said, Lucille Ball here to see Charlie Chaplin. And they said, he's not home and slammed the door in my face. <laughs> that was so oddly <laughs> coincidental. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was, we, 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 we were in sync. I would say we were in sync, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I knew she had studied with Buster Keaton because uh, she talked about it uh, when he was, um, after his, his heyday he was at mgm as a gag man and he took her under his wing and taught her how to use props and how, taught her how to do this and taught her how to do that so if you watch lucy and then you go back and watch buster keaton you can see a, a very similar style hmm. now you mentioned a lot of encounters with lucille ball a lot of things that happened yeah. between you and her but what do you know about lucille ball that we don't uh huh oh yeah good question i think I think she was, I don't think she thought of herself as brilliant as the rest of us did. I think she was just a, a you know, a Yankee girl working for, to, to, for her family. I don't think there was that much of a, a drive to be the greatest comedian of all time, you know. Hmm. I, I remember when uh, on the set of her last TV show and I was talking to her, she did something and I laughed and she, and she said, is that funny? And I said, yeah, that's funny. And she said, I, I would know. I haven't known what's funny in 30 years. When everybody laughs at every single thing you do, you lose perspective. Oh, interesting. And that blew me away, you know? Yeah. And I've, and I've seen that in other people. I, even when I saw, when I was filming the movie Taps, Bob Hope came to the military academy to give an award to somebody and, and we snuck in the back just so we could watch the ceremony. And he was doing the same jokes you'd seen him do, do a thousand times. You know, he'd have a pretty girl there and say, this is what you're fighting for. And everybody would laugh. 
And it wasn't funny when you'd see it on on TV, but in person, because it was Bob Hope, you laughed. And I thought, well, there's probably a lot of that with these people, all these big, giant, legendary people. How do you? How can you tell anymore if you're funny or not? You must have somebody in your in your pocket, you know, who you trust. But uh, for the most part, everybody thinks everything you do is funny. You you can't tell anymore. Much the same with sitcoms, because you know I, I would sit at home and watch The Big Bang Theory, and I'm like, what are these people laughing at? But then I went to a taping of The Big Bang Theory, and it was a completely different experience. You're in that moment; those actors are right in front of you, and you do laugh. But at home, yeah. it just doesn't come through. You're like, these people in the audience are idiots. Why do they? You know, it wasn't that funny. <laughs> you know, but at the time, it is. <laughs> I hope I never get to that point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you share a lot of your success with your writing partner and one of your best friends, uh, somebody that you had been uh, with writing with ever since high school, Jane Milmore. And sadly, she passed yeah. away this year. And I am sorry for your loss. I want to start out saying that. Thank you. Thank you. We were together for 46 years. Oh. And, uh, and you know, we, we ended up thinking with one mind. That she, you know, we'd finish each other's sentences. We'd shoot a look across the room. We knew the entire story that they were saying with their eyes. Um, and you know, in terms of, in terms of writing, we, we became one person too, but she was my, you know, she, she started out as my girlfriend. Then we started writing together and, uh, 46 years together. And it's still surreal that she's not here, but I, I still talk to her. You obviously wrote all these shows together. How common is it to have a writing partner? I mean, that seems like a very unique thing because I know there's teams of writers on shows, but I don't know of a lot of pairs like that. The, uh, yeah, the, what, what ended up happening, we started out, so Bob, Bob Carroll Jr., Madeline Davis, I Love Lucy writers, were also a couple when they started out and then just were writing partners. We had a lot of similarities with the two of them. We'd go to their, we went to their office to interview them for a TV special we did. And I looked at Madeline's desk and went, that's my desk. And Jane looked at Bob's, which had stuff all over it. She said, that's my desk. They were just like us. Um, <laughs> The, the, there aren't a lot of teams, but the, what there are, uh, a lot of agents will put together teams, um, because, you know, you, you can get two people work easier than you can one for the same money, basically. Um, and a lot of times if you have a woman and a man, it's like, okay, you're, you know, that's good too. Uh, but those, those teams don't last because, um, you've got to have, there's got to be a reason the two of you are together writing. You know, if you have two people who are trying to hog the computer, that's not a team. Right. You know, I, the way I describe it is uh, the best way you, the best team you can have is to find somebody who you think is so much funnier and better than you are and have them think the same thing of you. <laughs> mm. And then your job is to try and make them laugh. You know, uh, that's when, you know, it, it clicks. And, um, and we have, you know, we, we had a we had a shorthand of working together too. Um, every script is different, obviously, and, and we run a lot of plays, and they they're different from the TV show, and that we don't have to answer to anybody. Um, but uh, we pretty much, you know, we would talk out what we want to do, and then I would do a first draft, and then Jane would rip it apart, <laughs> and then okay. I would. I would insult all the things she took out. You know, what you don't know what's funny, you know, we'd fight. And then finally we'd, uh, we'd, we'd go back and forth until we finally got a draft we liked together. And then, um, the weird thing with, with writing with a, with a partner, when you write by yourself, you know, it's a paranoid thing to turn, you know, finish a script, turn it in to somebody and you know, hope to hope to God you didn't blow it, you know? But, uh, when you're writing with a team, after a while you become one person. So it starts out as the other person telling you, you know, no, this is good. No, oh, this is great. Don't worry about it. You suddenly become two paranoid people turning in the same script going, I hope people don't hate this, you know. Huh. Uh, but uh, we did uh, 23 plays together and uh, we've been touring the, uh, the, the newest one, uh, the last Billion Jane script, I guess, uh, was a musical called The Boomer Boys Musical. We were touring that for two and a half years before the pandemic hit. 
and we'll start touring that again. Uh, Jane wasn't in it just coincidentally. And, um, and that'll actually feel good because it'll feel like she's still part of whatever, you know, when that continues. Yeah. Now, I'm sorry. I'm not asking so much about the plays. I'm, I'm just very into oh, mo- movies and television. And the one show that I want to jump to now is new heart. It's a, a show that I only vaguely remember like my parents watching and stuff. But I loved how in the book you easily explain the role of a writer that walks into an eighth season of a television show just to make Uh it fresh and not repeat material from the first seven seasons. Now, I assume that you hadn't had time to sit and watch all of the episodes as they were airing. How do you make sure that you are writing, you know, new material for a well-established show? What they did for us, anybody... uh we were, I'd say three quarters of the writing staff was, was new to that show when we came on it. Uh, our first job for the first, I think it was a week and a half, maybe, maybe just a week. We sat and watched every episode from the beginning of the show up until when we came to work. Um, just so we could not only learn the characters, but see if there's any little things that we picked up along the way that we wanted to you know, be consistent about. And if there was a storyline that they'd already done, you know, you know not to go down that route. Mm -hmm. But when you first came to work, you were given about a week to come in with, I think they told us five story ideas. So every, every new writer came in with five stories and then they ended up picking one or two of your stories. And that became the thing you wrote. Um, or else it's a, uh, Oh no, we did that in season four. Then you don't go back and look at that again. You know, um, and the, the nice thing for me was, uh, Mark Egan and Mark Solomon, who were running the show were, um, uh, they were writers for Bob Carroll Jr. and Madeline Davis, the Lucy writers on a show called Alice. So they worked the same as Bob and Madeline. And so I, I sort of, you know, the Lucy connection again, uh, the Lucy people taught Bob and Mark and Mark who taught us, um, Every uh, and the way they ran their shows was the same way Bob and Madeline did, where you ran, you did every t- uh, scene once, one take, move on. Um, so you shot the whole show in an hour and a half, like a play. Was this um, a four, like three or four camera show? Yeah, okay. uh, it was three three cameras back then. Uh, people use four now, but um, it was three camera show, and it was uh, filmed on film without a video assist. So you just trusted that the camera guys caught everything they needed to do. And you didn't find out until the editors started working on the shows, uh, if they had all the shots they needed. Hmm. And they said in, I think the eight, eight years of that show, they, they missed maybe one shot. Wow. So, uh, this was, the crew was fantastic on that show. And so was Bob. Bob set the whole standard, uh, for how the, how the show worked. Um, the star of the show sets, the mood of the show. Um, you, you've, I'm sure you've heard about some horror shows, you know, where it's usually the, the star of the show is a, is a nightmare. Yes. Uh-huh. Not, not this one. Not this one. This one felt like one big family. Um, and it was all because of Bob. And I think there's, was there a comment in the book that I read something about the fact that his appearance uh, towards the end of the show was he looked younger than the beginning of the show or something like that? Yeah, they shot they shot the first, maybe just the first season, but maybe the first two seasons on videotape, which is not very forgiving. Yeah, and they switched it over to film. So when we were watching, you know, the the, the first seven, uh, six, whatever it was, uh, seasons of the show, when we got there, uh, we, we it was like, God, he looks really old. And then suddenly, third season hit, and it was like, Oh no, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, a uh, film anytime, you know, a lot of times with, uh, uh, you know, actresses of a certain age, uh, you'll also see if they're the star of the show, it's shot on film because they look better. When I looked over your IMDb before I read your book, I thought, oh my gosh, he wrote for the show Martin. How weird is it that a white guy is writing for Martin? So I definitely <laughs> checked out those chapters of the book and read those, uh, in full. And I immediately thought about like what would happen if, white people started writing a show where, you know, it was for black people for a black audience. And I, 
probably would expect someone to pass on that opportunity to write that just because of it could be controversial or you you know obviously these days with social media you could be, get picked apart but you and jane didn't back away from writing martin so why was that well uh, two part two reasons first one was there was a series of uh, art galleries in California called the Martin Lawrence galleries. So when they first called us up about taking the meeting, I thought it was, they wanted to write a show about an art gallery. <laughs> so we said we'd take the meeting. <laughs> uh, but the other thing that sold me was, was Martin Lawrence. I just thought that we saw his stand up and we thought he was hilariously funny. Um, and we met with John Bowman who, who created the show and he wanted us to write on it. And I said, well, look, I'm not black. I can't pretend I'm black. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to write what I think the jargon would be, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. I said, I can write male, female stuff. Right. And if we have, you know, and the rest of the, the rest of the, uh, staff were all African-American. So if we, we, if I said something that, that a, that a black guy wouldn't say, so they'd say, no, Billy, come on. You say this instead. Oh, okay, fine. And we change it. But uh, we were there primarily uh, primarily to write the male-female uh, thing. And But in terms of, you know, I'm not Irish Catholic and I could write for Newhart. So, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, you don't have to be whatever it is you're writing. You right. just have to, you know... No, you know, you just have learn to learn and know about it. Educate yourself. Yeah, you just educate yourself. Um, I always hear, you know, writing people give uh, students advice. Writing students write about what you know, and I, and I don't agree with that. I think write about what you can learn about. That that works too. Hmm. Yeah, but uh, the the stupid thing was after Martin, we immediately got a call to do. Uh, what was after that? The Wayans Brothers? Yep. And, and we, so we did the Wayans Brothers, and we got a call to do D.L. Hughley's show. I said to Jane, I said, why are they, just because we did a show with one black lead guy in it, why do they think we're suddenly the experts on all these, on being black? It's bizarre. Martin is not the same person as the Wayans Brothers. They're not the same person as D.L. Hughley. It doesn't make any sense. She said, well, it's a job. And it's like, okay, <laughs> that's right. Well, if uh, one, one gets you to the next, I guess it's okay. Yeah, we did We did a show for uh, Olympia Dukakis uh, out here, which was based on a British show. And we did a Brit- a trans- American translation of a British show. The next season uh, came along, and we were offered like four different British shows. It's like, guys, you know, just because you do one thing doesn't mean you can't do it another thing. All right. Now, one thing that I was impressed about with Jane, Martin Lawrence was uh, often upset on the set, and apparently he walked into the writing room. He pointed out that there was a lack of black writers, right? Mm -hmm. But it was your writing partner, Jane, who stood up and said, look, I'm the only woman at the table, and nobody was bothered about that. And that seemed like a very bold thing to do. Was that, like, was that Jane? Was that how she would stand up for herself? Oh, yeah. Yeah, little ballsy Irish uh, Jersey girl. Yeah, so, <laughs> no, so no, nobody got away with anything in front of her. Uh, but the the thing was, it it, it it pissed him off so much to hear that because it was something he had never even considered. I will say this: as much as 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 difficult as Martin was to work with, uh, and he was, um, he he was his own director, writer, producer for all the years he was doing stand-up and to go from that into a, a sitcom situation where somebody else is telling you what works and what doesn't work and what's funny and what isn't funny. That's a weird transition for somebody to go through. Um, I could, I can't blame him for any of that. And his, his goal was always to make the show better. So he it made him may not have been the most delicate way to do it, but, uh, but we all had the same. We all had the same goal, and that was to do a good show. Sure. Um, you know, he also, you know, talking about uh, writing for uh, because I'm white. We uh, he came into the room once to screaming at me. You know, what is all this guy stuff? I said, what are you talking about? He said, in this script, you have me saying something about you guys, and we don't. 
we don't say black guys don't say guys we say brother now you guys have been writing for me for three years you know. so he said he said the word guy while he was yelling at me for <laughs> not, for writing the word guy it was it was really funny you brothers have been writing for him that's the way you know yeah yeah a little trivia though for your readers in this book and something i found out is you were present for the catchphrase being born you go girl yeah yes that's kind of cool yes. um, it was so weird because it martin we he would do one take of every scene and you and if somebody messed up you covered and you kept going that was you know he that's the way he wanted to work and we loved working that way too it's great so there was one I, I wish i could go back and remember which episode it was i gotta i gotta actually find this out but there was one run uh, one taping where he forgot his line in the middle of the of, in the middle of talking and he he said you and he couldn't remember the rest of the line and he just went you go girl and the audience laughed at it and he was so sweet about how he said it that john bowman the the creator of the show and i immediately looked at each other and went oh that's staying in that's staying <laughs> in the script so we started putting it in the script and who knew? Yeah, it's <laughs> still knew being it used gonna... now. Now we know we didn't write it. Martin, it was all Martin, but we 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 okayed it and stuck it in the script. And then within the year, it's on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh, <laughs> I know when we we got it, we won a People's Choice Award for that show. And uh, Whoopi Goldberg was presenting, and somebody in the audience well yelled, "You go, girl!" And she didn't. I guess she hadn't watched our show. She thought she was being heckled. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, but now it's everywhere. It is it's everywhere. And you didn't get to go yeah, to that, that award show either, did you? I didn't. Uh, no, the the People's Choice Award we went to. Oh, okay. There we was one. Invited, we we weren't we weren't invited to the uh, the NAACP award thing, and, or the Image Awards. And why is that? They didn't want to, them to know why people were writing part of the show. I don't know. <laughs> I just don't know. Okay. All I know is I wasn't invited. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm glad the show won. So that, that part was good, but I, I don't know. Now the book has been out since June. So people have had a chance to check it out and read it, including the stars and in, that you mentioned, has anybody come back to you to say, Oh, that's not the way I remember it. Or I wish you wouldn't have put that in there. Or you forgot about this. Any stories that, you know, have come uh, up like Jul that? Julia Duffy from Newhart, uh, called me up to tell me how much she loved the book and that Bob Newhart loved the book. And uh, and then reiterated the fact that the first script we wrote for her on that show is the, her favorite of the entire series, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And Richard Lewis called me up uh, as soon as the book came out, and he said, uh, "I'm so excited for you! You know, I can't wait to read the book." And I said, "Oh, say thanks." And I hung up the phone and I immediately panicked. What did I say about him? And uh, <laughs> so I pulled the book off the shelf and I'm rifling through it because yeah. we did a couple of shows for him. And I was like, do I insult him? Do I insult him? No, no. Okay, we're good. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> but uh, but I I have not heard from uh, I have not heard from Martin. Yeah, Martin Lawrence uh, is the I, one I was really wondering about if he had come back and said anything. No, I haven't. I haven't seen him in years. Um, who else have we talked to that? Uh, and I'm still. Uh, I keep getting little notes from people, but uh, overall, it's good. Yeah, it's all good. Now, before I run out of time, on Fan Counters, the hook of our show is that we ask our guests to tell us about their weird, crazy, maybe just a fun or strange experience you might have had with a fan. So if you think about the amount of times that fans have come up to you, is there anything that... Oh, I, I know. Okay. I do have one. The very first time I, I dealt with celebrity, let's say, uh, Jaws 2 had just opened. They had my name in my hometown. They had my name on the marquee, which was sweet. And this woman, and it was a multiplex. So, you know, there's a couple of different movies playing. Okay. So this woman comes up to me in the lobby, and she starts shoving pieces of paper at me. Oh, could I have your autograph? I said, oh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I signed, signed my name. She said, could you write one for my neighbor? They're, they're going to be so thrilled. I said, oh, yeah, of course. And I signed something for the neighbor. And then she said, oh, oh, my cousins, my cousins. You got to write one for my cousins. I said, okay. So I filled out like seven, eight things for her. And I said, so did you, uh, did you go in to see Jaws 2? 
She said, no, we're going to see Grease because John Travolta is better than you. <laughs> really? Yeah, that was my, my introduction to celebrity. Wow. <laughs> what have you done for me lately? Didn't last very long. <laughs> I know, right? Jeez. Uh, never, never a stalker, right, Billy? No, that was my territory with Lucy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Except that that turned out really well. Uh, and I guess the last question is that you brought Lucy up one more time, and, and I had written a little note tidbit on here that when you were watching, oh, Life with Lucy, you went there to watch her first episode, and I found it yeah. interesting that you mentioned that John Ritter was there too. Were John Ritter and Lucille Ball known friends? John Ritter was the guest star in the episode we were watching. Oh, okay. So he, so he and his wife, Gail Gordon, uh, Ann Dusenberry, my friend from Jaws 2, who played Lucy's daughter, and uh, maybe two or three other people were all invited to dinner and then to watch the show. And uh, he was a really sweet guy. I actually wrote for him a couple of times. Uh, he guessed it on uh, Anything But Love. I think we wrote two episodes for him there. Really nice guy. Um, but, uh, boy, she loved him. Lucy loved him because he, he did the same kind of stuff she did. Yeah, it was very uh, sh- kind of, I don't know if they call it, like, shtick acting where, you know, you have uh, gags or you're falling and, and that kind of stuff. John Ritter always did that. I kind of wonder what those encounters were like if they, uh, and I'm sure they wouldn't one-up each other with jokes or with uh, gags or anything, but what were those encounters like with them? I mean, was it all? No, they weren't. Let me, uh, the, the thing about most, in my mind, the best comedians aren't funny until they're working. You don't see, they're not, they're not stand-up comedians who are always trying to top you with a joke. Lucy was not particularly funny in person. John Ritter was just a nice guy. And then they'd study the script and they'd figure out the bits they were going to do and all that stuff. But um, no, it's not, not the same as when you're in a room full of stand-up comics, and, and which is fine you know but it's it's a completely different animal well yeah you hear all the time people are like go up to a comedian oh tell me a joke and it's like it's not really yeah. you know it doesn't work like that right have you done book signings with this book uh at all i mean i know with covid <laughs> just through the mail tough, just but... through the mail uh i guess people can get uh this the uh, autographed uh, books on my website uh you can get but other than that uh, I've been waiting. Yeah. I just if the world would just come back to normal, I'll be happy to go do some. Um, but uh, no, uh, no, not, not one single book I've, sighting. That was kind of dumb. I forgot that you're in Los Angeles <laughs> area where everything is completely locked down. Here in Milwaukee, I know that we're like the COVID capital right now, but we still have tons of like it's some. Most people live like nothing's going on, so it's kind of weird. Well. Put those two things together, and you may figure out why you're <laughs> the COVID capital of the world. But yeah, but yeah, yeah. No, we're all I'm, wear, wear my mask and stay apart. We got restaurants for ta- Luckily, we, you know, we got California weather. So when you go to a restaurant, the tables are outside and they're ten, twenty feet apart from each other, and that's all cool. Yeah, but it's not quite the same as as the rest of the country. Are you doing any other active writing at the moment? Always writing. Always writing. Um, the, the, when Jane was sick, she was sick for about 15 months. And during that time, you know, we, we truly thought this was something they were going to find a cure for. And it, was, it didn't make any sense because she hadn't shown any symptoms and all this sort of thing. Um, so she insisted we work together. And we did two, maybe two, three days a week the entire time she was sick until about two weeks before she passed away. Wow. So I've got a lot of half written projects and uh i'm still working on those and uh working with some different ideas for a second and third book that i want to do um so uh yeah but i i I, unfortunately (laughs) fortunately for me it's built in now where i wake up i go straight to the computer and i start writing um i guess that's good but that's great uh, yeah i i I gotta learn to you know enjoy myself once in a while too (laughs) Well, someday soon we'll be able to go out and enjoy ourselves again. So, That's right. That's right. Planning on that. Billy Van Zandt, it has been an exceptional interview. I really do appreciate it. If I would uh, send you a text after, it would just say thank you again. I had a great time, and uh, 
I want everybody to go out and get this book. It's called Get in the Car, Jane, Adventures in the TV Wasteland. You can get it on Amazon and also Billy Van Zandt's website if you want him to sign it. Sounds like you're going to do that too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. This was fun. Nice talking to you too. It was great. My thanks to Billy Van Zandt for being on the show this week. Love the book. It's a perfect gift for Christmas. Go ahead and pick that up for somebody who enjoys hearing stories about those television shows and movies of the 70s and 80s, and uh, they'll definitely enjoy the book for sure. Now, let's move on to our last segment before we end the podcast today. How can celebrity podcasts be this bad? Hello, listener. This is Jason Bateman, along with Will Arnett and Sean Hayes for the podcast called Smartless. If that's a place you're looking for, you found it. Congratulations. It's not a real high concept podcast. No, it's not a high concept podcast. In fact, it's not even a high content podcast. This is the show Smartless. He did introduce the hosts of the show. And it's like kind of my new arch nemesis. I've kind of gotten sick of picking on Dax Shepard, so I've moved on to these three chuckleheads. And I call them that because they did an episode recently with, uh, I guess it's a hockey owner slash player, Brendan Shanahan. I am not a hockey fan, so I was not aware of who like this person was. But the problem with celebrity podcasts is that they bring on their friends. And, and they make no mistake about this. They are bringing on their celebrity friends on this show which is usually not a problem if you have got great things to talk about and you want to make it relatable to people who are not friends with this person. But that is not what this podcast does. They just chuckle along with their friend. And here's a prime example. I didn't really know at the time that it would lead to all of this. Otherwise, I probably would have walked away. But um... <laughs> what was the next step, the changing rooms? I mean, was he like saying, well, let me see that on you. And all, I mean, you want fresh eyes, right? <laughs> You want fresh. Right. <laughs> it's just nonstop laughter, and I'm not even sure why they're laughing. In this next clip, Jason Bateman starts telling a little story, and Sean Hayes cannot control himself. His annoying high pitch laughter just dominates the clip. I have no idea what's funny here, and if you do, send me an email because I am clueless. Was I just <laughs> obnoxious, or was I trying to like make fun of people? Both. Well, I guess that's both. both. Yeah. Because yes, 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 <laughs> there's no or in that sentence. <laughs> but where, can you remember any of that? Because I certainly can't remember any. But like, what was I like? Billy Van Zant just pointed out something that I hope you caught on to, and that is the fact that when comedians sometimes are laughed at all the time, like Lucille Ball said, I don't even I don't know when I'm funny anymore because people laugh at everything. That is definitely what's going on in this podcast because the laughter just continues for no reason. You might not look tough, but that you were and that you were. (laughs) were I have no idea what is so funny there, but there is one good point that Jason Bateman does bring up. This is going to be so controversial. I can't wait for people to say, how dare they say that? But we got our Michael Jordan. No one's listening. With he says, no one's listening. Uh, I wish that were true. By the way, his the reviews are going up. A lot of people are listening to the show, and I'm not quite sure why. The guy who drafted him as a player was now coming to work for him as his general manager. How cool is that? We just lost our listener. (laughs) That did actually make me chuckle a little bit. We just lost our listener. Um, I probably have lost my listener now, too. But they let's end with this one thing. They bring on this hockey player, right? Brendan Shanahan. And Will Arnett and Jason Bateman, no doubt, have dominated the entire conversation. And the only thing that Sean Hayes has really been able to contribute is his rambunctious laughter. And he explains why. You know, being gay, you can imagine I'm an enormous hockey connoisseur. (laughs) (laughs) So they laugh about that. But I don't know what's funny about that because I didn't know that gay people couldn't like hockey. What I don't like about Sean saying that is that I don't like the fact that people who say, hey, I'm this, so I can't be that. Sean's basically saying, well, I'm gay, so I can't like hockey or I don't like hockey. I'm sure there's a lot of gay people that like hockey. And I don't think that we should be in this country saying, well, I'm this, so I can't be that. Isn't that what we've kind of been trying to get rid of this whole time? I'm a woman, so now I can't be that. Yes, you can. You can, and that's what I'm trying to teach my girls, too. They can be anything they want. 
And I hope that we can stop saying things like that and having celebrities who have a podcast, you should be role modeling the kind of behavior and the kind of change you're preaching in this world instead of just hammering home. I have, since I one thing, I can't be another. And that's a bunch of garbage. Anyway, that's Smartless for this week. And that's my little rant for this week. So I will let you go. <laughs> if you want to contribute to Fan Counters, the show you're listening to, you can email us at hello at fancounters.com. Now, next week, I've got another celebrity guest joining me. I say that every week because every Friday, I release a brand new episode with an interview done not as a friend because I'm not friends with any of these people. I'm a fan. So I go and I reach out to these folks and I get them on the show because I'm a fan of them. I've enjoyed a piece of their work. So I want to talk to them about how that work came to light. And I want to learn a little bit more about the person in the process. And that is what the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast is all about. I'm not here to be controversial. In fact, I'm here to be an escape. I want to be that place that you can go just for a good time to learn a little bit more about the shows and the movies and the music that you listen to on a daily basis. And I hope I can provide an escape from all the weird stuff that's going on in this world instead of contributing to, oh my gosh, I got to turn that guy off. So anyway, uh, now I'm going to let you go so you don't have to turn me off. This has been the Fan Counter Celebrity Podcast. My name's Nick, and I would love to have you back next week and every week. Go to iTunes. I guess it's called Apple Podcasts now, but give us a five-star review. Say a few words about me. Make my week, and I, I would really appreciate it. That's all I got for you. Talk to you next Friday, okay? Take care. Bye-bye.